Well, welcome back to Otaku, the talk show where otaku talk about otaku topics. And I am very privileged today to be speaking to none other than uh, Fred Schote, who has been involved in manga particularly, but also, you know, as a result, uh, the history of anime uh, for quite a number of years, involved in some amazing stuff. I had some of his stuff right here. Uh, manga Manga, the world of Japanese po uh, comics, which I want to talk to you about that particularly. Uh, Dreamland Japan, uh, the Astro Boy essays, uh, Pluto, which you may have heard of, uh, uh, recently, Osama Tezuka's Phoenix, Astro Boy, no he didn't write these, but he was very much involved in the translation of those. Um, so th thank you very much for joining us. Oh no, it's a pleasure to be here. Actually I'm not... Well, we're speaking virtually. I shouldn't say it's a pleasure to be here. I'm not sure where I am. I'm in the, uh, the cloud, I guess. <laughs> Isn't technology amazing? Yeah, it is amazing. And that segues beautifully uh, uh, into uh, probably the, the, you know, one of the things you're best known for, um, uh, besides the books, is working on the translations of Astro Boy. And I was wondering if you'd talk a little bit about that. I've read various reports about how the, all that came about, and I was wondering if you could kind of, uh, you know, talk a bit about uh, how all that got started of actually bringing Astro Boy over here to America. Uh, yeah, actually, I was, I, as I recall it, I was, um, for the manga, I was asked to do the translation by Dark Horse. But, of course, I had nothing to do with the original anime. That goes back even much, much further. Sure. That goes um, back to 1963. Mm -hmm. And that was mainly Fred Ladd who was involved with, with that. Uh, I was just involved in translating the manga, which are the basis for the anime series. Sure. And uh, as I remember it, um, Dark Horse just asked me if I was interested, and I jumped at the chance because I had been interested in Astro Boy for some time, and I'd also had this um, uh, goal, I guess, or project in the, on the back burner of doing a book about Astro Boy. So it all fit together for me perfectly. And um, I also just love the Astro Boy stories because they're something that I think has been overlooked by a lot of fans of Astro Boy. Because, the, of course, by the time you get to the anime, a lot of the stories are highly diluted. And the original stories, which were created starting in 1951, 52, mm -hmm. um, were actually very provocative. Mm -hmm. Now, you go back today and you read them, and some of them are really quite shocking. <laughs> uh, and a lot of the, a lot of the content, and the original intent, and the lit original subject matter that Tezuka was dealing with, of course, was he filtered out when he had to convert his stories for the television series in Japan, which was broadcast in 1963. And then even more uh, stories and more content, of course, was filtered out for broadcast in the United States and other countries around the world. So to go back to the originals, uh, I just found it, uh, in rereading some of the stories, uh, I was just so amazed by the way Tezuka was able to approach some of these very, very complicated issues in what's essentially you know, a medium of entertainment at that time for around 10, 11-year-old boys. <laughs> uh, but because the manga medium was not so developed, he was able to do uh, just about anything he wanted to. Um, uh, he takes this you know, very adult approach in exploring philosophical issues and um, even relig almost religious issues and political issues in this manga medium uh, which when he began, he was really targeting, you know, 10, 11 year old boys. Yeah, and it's one of the amazing things I think about Tezuka in general is how he was able to tackle such a, well, he was willing to tackle such a wide variety of issues in the series. Um, you know, uh, let me say, you know, racism, extremism. Uh, all sorts of isms that he explored and did so in a way that it, it's one of the amazing things about Astro, I think, is that it maintains this very strong dichotomy between good and evil while also exploring these issues in a way that doesn't come down very uh, you know, hard over your head with one particular interpretation of that. 
Um, no, that's right. I guess the word here, the operative word, would be didactic. He tries to avoid <laughs> yeah. the, being preachy, and and he does a great job. And uh, I found all the stories to be not only entertaining, but I thought, right. holy cow, how in the world did he? He's thinking of these things, uh, you know, in the early 1950s that we're facing today. One of the most amazing things about the whole Asherboy story is the fact that although Tezik began creating it in 1951-52, in the story, uh, Asherboy is born on April 7th, 19, um, 2003. Mm -hmm. So even though Tezuka created it 50 years earlier than 2003, he was projecting forward to 2003. So he's projecting forward to our time, even though that's already, what, eight years ago, mm. although it doesn't seem like that. Oh, no, um, but but to think that you know he was imagining a world that we live in he didn't live in. <laughs> he was way before that but he was imagining our world and and some of the issues we would have and actually if you read between the lines I mean there's, there there are some things that he it's a manga too so he, he, he it was a, a different world than we actually have it's a much he was envisioning a much more analog world and a more mm -hmm. mechanical world which is understandable because. Most people had never seen a computer then. Uh, there was no internet or anything like that. But nonetheless, there's a lot of issues there that revolve around things like artificial intelligence and um, you know mis machine power that we face today. Uh, really existential issues that uh, he was grappling with and imagining uh, back then. And, and civil rights for robots. You know, as robots evolve, you know how many how much rights should we give them? And, yeah. And, uh, and and the robots look different. I mean, they look more clunky than what we imagine today. But we do live in a world. Uh, surrounded by robots, we just don't think about them. Mm. If you go to a bank and you pull money out of an ATM, in a, in a way you're you're interacting with a kind of a robot. And uh, sure. when you call up uh, your phone company and they ask you for voice recognition, all that stuff is it's a kind of a robot. So uh, our world is starting to resemble some of the things that he envisioned. Absolutely, and you know, like you say, he was ta tackling things like intolerance which certainly is one of the biggest things that we have to tackle today. That's right, yeah. And, and uh, I mean, in our lives, we haven't really thought much about whether, you know, um, smashing a machine is bad for the machine or not, mm -hmm. or the machine if the machine hurts or not, but we probably will have to start thinking <laughs> about that pretty soon because the machines are getting pretty sophisticated. They're probably going to, you know, squeal with pain in the near future <laughs> when we uh, hack, uh, whack them with a hammer or something. I know I always feel like taking a hammer to my computer, but uh, pretty, pretty soon I won't dare. <laughs> well, there was a story, I think a couple of months back, about a Japanese robot being developed as essentially a seeing eye dog. Um, and and uh, it was pointed out in the, in the review that on the one hand, um, you know, in Japan, robots are to a great extent seen as helpers, partly because of Astro Boy. And also, this is a perfect sort of use for that technology. And I thought, well, boy, that's you know, that's that point at which robots suddenly, you know, cross over into everyday lives in that more you know obvious sense where we look and say, hmm, maybe this is more than just a clunky machine we can now just throw away whenever we want to. Uh, that's right. Actually, the seeing eye dog that robot that you mentioned is interesting because they uh, were developing those back, or trying to developing, develop those back in the late 1980s. Mm. Uh, so it's been a kind of a pet project within Japan and it's a really great example, like you say, of trying to use robots for peaceful purposes. In fact, I was told by some people in Japan that uh, one of the reasons that they didn't have robots, any robots ready to go into the nuclear power plants after the disaster in Fukushima is mm. precisely because there has been this focus on, you know, civilian uses of robotics and helping people and that sort of thing. And they haven't had a lot of military funded research and robots in nuclear power plants is something you're much more likely to come up with if you have a strong defense research, uh, military-oriented research program, which the United States does. And, and lo and behold, the United States did have robots that uh, uh, were uh, tough enough to go into a highly radioactive environment like that. Yeah. 
Um, and again, boy, isn't that an Osama Tezuka story right there? Oh, it is, and and it would be an Osama Tezuka story not because of what uh, happened at the nuclear power plant mm. alone, but because of this the stupidity of people and the the nearsightedness of people and the, basically the arrogance of, of, of people in assuming that. Uh, they could control this technology and that they they didn't have to worry about what nature would throw at them, which of course is a uh, it's a mistake that uh, humans repeat over and over and over again, not only in Japan but um, you know, everywhere, including here. It's uh, it's it's built into our we're hardwired to make mistakes because we we can't see forward far enough. That's my theory. <laughs> <laughs> like Reed Phoenix. My goodness. Yeah, exactly. Well, Tezuka was thinking way, way ahead. So. <laughs> well, a few yeah. millennia, a few million yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, he, he, uh, he, was, he, he was definitely broadening his perspective. <laughs> so getting back to Astro Boy, um, now I know one of the big frustrations of, of any work with Astro Boy is the fact that <laughs> – you know, every time it seemed that Astro was released, Tezuka would go back and tweak something. And so trying to decide what was the definitive Astro Boy has always been sort of a point of contention. Um, yeah, how, how do you approach that from a, not so much a translation perspective, uh, um, but um, just from, you know, knowing what was out there, I mean, you know, do you try to be faithful to all those different versions in whatever version that you're working with, or do you just kind of have to set that aside? Well, I think with um, with the manga, since the manga are the original stories, you know, I always try to go back and and deal with what I thought uh, Tezuka was intending at the time. Uh, so that was relatively easy. When it comes to a more sort of total version uh, uh, to nail a single version of Astro Boy, then it, it becomes a lot more difficult um, because as you said, it uh, changes. Um, and in that regard, actually, it was interesting. I saw a headline the other day. It was um, Twitter or something from this uh, publisher, this weekly that I follow, but they were talking about... Uh, I really thought about Tessica because they were talking about... But I didn't read the article, but the headline uh, seemed to be indicating that in the publishing industry there may be a new trend emerging in the digital world, at least, which in which there is no one finished work. Everybody is always going back and changing their work because, in, uh, you know, on the Internet and in digital books, you can make changes so easily. So... You don't really ever have to lock things down the way you did traditionally with uh, paper books where you had to freeze it, the content and then <laughs> send it to a printer and once it was once it went out the door once that you know content and information went out the door it was frozen but now you don't really have to do that anymore and that Tesco was kind of a pioneer in that regard because yeah. <laughs> with his manga uh, and with his animation, every time he did a, 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 a new version of Astro Boy, for example, he made significant changes. So mm. in the 1980 uh, anime series, for example, which I was actually a consultant on, mm. uh, Tezuka went back and, and, and changed Astro's source of power. So in the original mm. story, he had a... Um, atomic reactor uh, in his chest and it was something that wasn't emphasized in the United States uh, that was kind of downplayed but that was a big part of the original story mm -hmm. and in the 1980 animation Tezuka retained this you know, nuclear power element but he made him a uh, fusion a fusion nuclear power which of course is safe for the environment <laughs> much, much safer for the environment uh, and that was his way of going back and, and and trying to tweak the design of Astro Boy for uh, the 1980s where there was a different attitude towards nuclear power um, because when he began creating the story in the 1950s, Japan had just come out of the war where it had been the world's first victim uh, of two atomic bombings and there was a, a, a fear of nuclear weapons, but there was also this hope uh, not only in Japan, but it's all around the world that somehow atomic energy or atomic 
uh, uh, technology which had been used to kill people could somehow be turned for peaceful uses. Mm. So in the very original stories, that was a big motivator. And by the time Tenzaka got to 1980, uh, then you had a very strong anti-nuclear power movement emerging uh, throughout the world and, um, uh, and and in Japan as well. So that was uh, so when he changed the design of the power plant in Astro Boy, it was kind of a response to uh, what he saw around him. Of course, in, in 1953, 54, there there were, were people weren't talking about uh, nuclear fusion power. That was a whole other thing. <laughs> And we're still waiting for that. So. Yeah. <laughs> With bated breath. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think it's actually one of his, you know, one of the great strengths of doing that. I remember going back and you know, as I was reading through the Astro Boy manga for the first time, seeing how Tezuka would go back and rework Astro's uh, uh, origin story. And yeah. you know, seeing the original one and how it was very much, you know, okay, here's the premise let's move on and how he was able to really expand on that and 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 make that something uh uh just much more fleshed out and colored if you will in in, in later editions um, and that's that's right in in the manga series that's especially evident because actually the origin story was something he kind of developed as he went along in the very beginning it started out it was uh, Astro Boy wasn't even the hero uh, of the story. It was a, a, a kind of a goulash, a, a real melange of, <laughs> of all sorts of uh, characters who were thrown into this situation. And, and the character that was Astro Boy was an uh, emissary uh, to, with these, an interface with these alien forces. And he had a very sort of minor role, really, in the very in the very first episode. And then Tezuka went back, and because he. He, the, the editor suggested to him that he make uh, Astro Boy, or Atom, as he's known in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, the main character. So he sort of went back and reworked the story and he evolved the origin story as he went along. So if you actually look at the Dark Horse version of, of Astro Boy, you can see uh, the very first uh, story that he penned is actually, I think, later, much later in the series. And what's in the manga as the origin story is something that he came up with much, much later. Now, I, I, one of the things I noticed in this uh, was how savvy, and I, I have, I think, 22 volumes of that manga sitting right here, and, and one of the things I noticed is how savvy um, Dark Horse was in selecting material. You know, did you influence you know, that order and what they selected in terms of when it went in and when it was published? Uh, for the Astro Boy series, actually, Dark Horse uh, only selected the fact that they were going to reproduce the full Japanese series from, I think it was Sunday Comics. Um, they didn't tinker with the the sequence of the stories at all, as I recall. So that, that's the that twenty three volumes is is essentially the way that it appeared in Japan, as I recall. Oh, and, oh I should not say it as it it's mm -hmm. not in the time sequence that, that the stories appeared in Japan, but it's in the sequence that that particular edition of the Tetsuhapa manga was it, it compiled by. Um, in, in that particular edition, and then there are other editions, and they might have a different sequence. But Dark Horse was very faithful to the to the sequence that they licensed, to the edition that they licensed. Then that edition in Japan is generally regarded as the, the sort of official mm -hmm. uh, Tezuka-sanctioned um, <laughs> edition, you might say, different editions, and, and, and they may have different. Uh, you know, they may have different orders and uh, the different episodes to go get the different times. I don't know. Sure, sure. That's interesting. So now, you know, here you went. Well, uh, let's go back. Um, what first, I, I might know the answer to this, but what first got you interested in, well, interested in manga? 
Um, well, it, it's the, the old story that I've told many times, <laughs> and it's also a story that happened so long ago that it's really getting to be an old story. <laughs> but I, I was in Japan in 1970, uh, studying in a, in a university in Tokyo, and I had actually lived in Japan before that. But mm -hmm. uh, I was studying the Japanese language intensively, and uh, I was spending eight hours in a uh, classroom you know, drilling, having all these things drilled into my brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was also living in a dormitory on campus with other Japanese students. And uh, I noticed a lot of my Japanese friends were not spending much time studying at all. They were, <laughs> were actually reading these giant uh, manga magazines. And that looked like a lot of fun to me and, and much more fun than reading a textbook. So I started reading manga and I became completely hooked. Mm -hmm. And it was actually at a time in Japan when manga were breaking out of this uh, medium for children and they were becoming a medium of entertainment uh, for teenagers and young adults and kind of it was kind of like rock and roll in the United States it was it was becoming a mass media and a lot of the artists were very creative then like Tezuka they were experimenting it was kind of the golden period of of manga in a sense just like it, it, everyone has their bias of course but there are a lot of people who say that you know the real golden, golden years of rock and roll were the, the 60s and early 70s that sort of thing when when a media that was much more limited originally suddenly uh, started doing a lot of experimentation, experimentation and became a um, a way for very talented people to express themselves in new ways mm. So that would have been uh, early Gekiga movement? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of Gekiga that were appearing then. And it was, um, the Gekiga movement was in full force then. That is mm -hmm. correct. Uh, Tezuka himself was not part of the Gekiga movement, but he was very influenced by that. And actually in the Astro Boy series, you can see that because he has a couple of episodes which were frankly not his best, where he tried to turn uh, Astro Boy into a much more of a... Uh, adult uh, kind of hero, anti-hero, and it didn't. I think even Jessica would acknowledge that it may not have worked the way he he wanted it to. So everybody has different Astro Boys that they like. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, well, that's another you know interesting thing about Tessica was for me reading uh, some of his reactions to Gettinger originally, uh, and how he appeared to be very you know, reacting very strongly to some of the stuff he saw, uh, you know, pr uh, promulgated by that movement of saying that we're going to move away from children's manga and manga is not for children. Um, and he made some very cogent arguments. And then over time, you could see him, you know, understanding those points on a deeper level and saying, you know, that... And still, I, I, I very much appreciate his, his view that, okay, <laughs> we can still have manga for kids. That's okay. But not, yeah, no, yeah, he, he really can. struggled with that. Um, he, he, Tezuka was a highly competitive person <laughs> and uh, quite uh, quite jealous in some ways. Mm. Uh, and he had this innate desire uh, to always be ahead of other uh, artists. Mm. and always be seen as being in the forefront and he usually was in the forefront but on the Gekigan movement there was a brief period where he started to fall behind a little bit uh, so he made a conscious effort with his manga to to show that uh, he could fully compete with these people who were dealing with much more existential themes and more adult themes but there was always this vestigial aspect to his uh, manga stories that uh, let you know that he had a long career as an artist for smaller children because uh, as many there were many people who criticized in, him in Japan because of his artwork because mm. they said that his artwork always looked much more uh, like it was designed for you know younger people than other Gekiga artists might have used and of course the reason for that is that Tezuka started out as a, uh, an artist for mainly for uh, kids who were uh, you know, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, mm. and 
and he never completely was able to scrub his artwork of that style, even if he were creating something with a very adult theme, which he did later. Uh, you, you could always tell that he had come out of this field, and he himself was very self-conscious about that, and also yeah. the fact that he had had no no formal art training or anything like that. So it was a very unique uh, art style, uh, especially when he was doing many more adult themes. Mm. And that actually gets to one of the one of the things that I struggle with. <laughs>